some of the material at home. Great. So uh, I'm going to show a different set of slides. And again, both of these will be up there on the course site, probably before the office hours are out. Um, OK. Um, so dynamic modeling, I, I have this for health and healthcare, which is our main sort of uh, applications area of focus, but we're looking beyond that. Um, the, the truth is these tools have been widely applied in the commercial sphere, and we have companies that come to us to want to hire my students uh, in those spheres uh, quite regularly. Um, but um, really, the, the demand for this um, uh, underlies the general need in society um, to have um, tools, uh, methodologies, approaches, guidance to help address uh, the most complex challenges out there that we as societies face. The gnarly challenges, including what are sometimes known as wicked challenges, but, uh, but challenges beyond that that are, that are termed dynamically complex. And you know, in the health sphere, there's, there's many of these that we are called um, in our lab to, to help um, parties address. Um, uh, they include uh, uh, patterns involving the spread of infectious diseases like COVID-19 um, um, and uh, diseases that pop across the animal-human interface like COVID-19, like it was from pangolins or bats. Um, um, but it's also shown in, you know, the fact that we as a society have, have disparities that, that um, in, in many cases have, have arisen from inequities involving um, hugely different levels of, of, of health um, and quality of life and length of life um, across, an, across our society. Uh, we have interacting conditions um, uh, including COVID-19 with uh, a number of other issues. COVID-19 with, um, with uh, uh, um, overdoses, say, from opioids, um, which are at crisis levels uh, in a way that's intertwined with the, um, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And traditionally, we have interactions between, say, smoking and TB or, or TB and diabetes. Um, uh, interactions between HIV, AIDS, um, uh, violence and substance abuse in, in some areas, um, uh, mental health issues tied up with COVID-19 um, uh, uh, con related concerns, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a growing awareness on the health side about how many of these uh, issues play out over the life course with with exposures early in life of a child, for example, leading to, to later life outcomes that are um, enormously affected, you know, four decades, five decades later. It's been well documented on the health sphere. Um, in the sphere of antimicrobial resistance, one of these areas we work, it's kind of emblematic. You have um, of this of this these types of problems. You have. Um, you know, uh, different areas of the system that all affect each other. What goes on in the farm um, ends up affecting what goes on ultimately in hospitals and long-term care facilities in terms of drug-resistant bugs. Animals that are pumped full of antibiotics um, routinely uh, can develop uh, antimicrobial resistance, which can ultimately be, um, be transferred uh, into um, into hospitals, into communities, and into long-term care facilities. And those leading stewardship initiatives, like my uh, close colleague, Cheryl Waldner, and, and Vet College, um, who employs many of my students uh, doing modeling to, to help deal with the challenge of antimicrobial resistance, is working to, to lessen um, those, those dangers. Um, you know, we have uh, interventions that can occur on the farm, which, which ripple through to get health gains, say, um, of people dying from MRSA, um, uh, individuals in hospital. Um, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, a whole set of, of impacts of antimicrobial resistance in the public health sphere, even in areas like dental facilities in the community. And yet we typically have siloed management. Um, we have different people in charge of manage regulating issues in healthcare, 
from in the community from over in the sphere of, of farms. There's long delays associated with mutation and detection or selection for the bugs. There's feedbacks involving the multiplication of the bug and the fact that when you treat with a certain drug, it selects for things that are resistant to that drug. Um, and small mutations can end up having major effects, just like we've seen with Omicron sweeping across the world um, out of animal reservoirs or a, um, a person um, taking immunosuppressant drugs to um, cause you know, gridlock in hospitals um, in all across North America. And you know, what we're grappling with here scientifically is kind of a, a new type of science. Um, type of science where um, we need to, to, to go beyond understanding pieces and understanding a whole. And I, I hark back to the, to the ancient parable of the blind man and the elephant, um, you know, each grabbing on a piece of the elephant um, um, and thinking that's the full elephant and arguing that they know the essence of the elephant from the tail or from the trunk, from the tusk or from the, the ear, each arguing what the elephant looks like from their piece but not really dealing with the whole of the elephant. And what this course is about is understanding the elephant as a whole. It's about, it's about um, taking action at a practical level that requires understanding the elephant as a whole to prevent it from trampling crops or, or, um, or you know, uh, leading to, um, to breakdown in, um, in some, of the, uh, uh, some of the enclosures. Um, there are two key needs that explain that that drive this sort of modeling. One is a need when we look at patterns in the world to understand what's going on. Um, and uh, you know, across the COVID nineteen pandemic, decision makers have been um, uh, on a daily basis looking at all sorts of data emerging: test positivity, the number of cases diagnosed, the number of people admitted to the hospital, the number of people dying the number of people in hospital beds, the number of tests delivered, the amount of COVID-19 measured in wastewater, et cetera. And they need, to tell, they need to understand, what is this telling me about the underlying situation? Um, is this uptick in the number of cases uh, a bad sign we've got an incipient outbreak? Or is it a good sign that we're finding people that are sick instead of them just circulating silently in the community? The challenge here is that often, you know, for just reasoning informally, we have observations from the world. Um, we have some theory about what's going on in the world, but we have, it's really hard to go from those observations to say, is that supportive of my theory or not? Um, is this uptick merely a, a reflection of finding people who are already sick, or is it a reflection of a growth in the number of people that feel sick? Trying to understand that on the basis of our, our, of our thinking is really challenging. An even more vexing problem, a bigger problem, um, and a more urgent problem in many areas is um, the need to intervene. To ask, you know, where do we best intervene? If we want to reduce the spread of Omicron across our province um, in the next few months, you know, where should we uh, invest our money? Where's the biggest bang for the buck here? Um, is it in you know, large-scale testing? Is it in distributing these rapid antigen test kits? Is it, uh, does it lie in faster contact tracing? Does it lie on improving the masks we use in school, to N95 type quality? Um, is it requiring all teachers and students to be vaccinated? Is it a matter of uh, uh, more quickly identifying asymptomatic cases through expanding contact tracing to, to test them? There's all these choices that health decision makers have. Um, and left, uh, left on their own um, to have to choose between these choices, they have a, a really tough time because they want some desired outcome, fewer cases, you know, uh, less risk of hospital overload, fewer people dying from COVID-19, fewer kids ending up in ICUs. Um, but they're trying to reason about what's going on in the world um, in a way that, uh, that further layers on, they wanna change something, you know, and they wanna ask, okay, if I did this, what would the impact be? If I did that, what would the impact be? How would those compare in terms of 
how big the impact would be, how quickly I see the impact, how cost effective, how much bang I get for the buck. Um, they want to understand this, but if they pursue it only in their head, it's hopeless. Believe me, I've worked alongside these folks. <laughs> it's hopeless for me, it would be hopeless for them. Um, and in fact, studies at MIT, um, which is where I, I first formally applied this work over the span of about 15 years, um, uh, you know, I've shown that even the most technically um, uh, educated individuals, you know, people who have PhDs in engineering and use differential equations daily and have deep understanding or mathematics students who, who specialize in complex systems, they have terrible time achieving desired outcomes based on reasoning in their head. Uh, even a, even a, a fairly easy to describe system that's technically complex is almost impossible for them to control. And you know, the, the results of these, these challenges are writ large all around us. They're writ large in the disaster of um, you know, overflowing ICUs and of our perishing U of S colleagues during the Delta wave. Our modeling anticipated that in June, all throughout the summer, we warned the ministry. We showed them the warning indicators pointing ever more clearly to this, uh, to this coming wave and the likelihood of health system overload. And they decided they'd rather, um, rather risk it and just try to respond when the hospitals became close to overflowing. We told them that was a, uh, a uh, problematic strategy. Uh, in this case, they persisted. And uh, I lost colleagues as a result. Some of you may have had relatives who ended up in the hospital and many others had to be flown out of province to Ontario um, to secure ICU care. Um, some of them dying outside their home province. Uh, the consequences of these challenges are misperceptions. People get surprised in ways they didn't be if they um, had better guidance. Uh, policy resistance, we undertake an action and it secures only a fraction of what we hope to accomplish, or it takes far longer than we hoped, or it actually yields net negative consequences. Um, and uh, these things are all too common, um, even things that, that gain you the opposite. Um, we have problems coordinating uh, different parties. Um, planning and making decisions, designing our systems. All of these are more problematic. And you know, ultimately we risk like King Canute, um, the legend of King Canute in the, in the uh, year a thousand or so in England, trying to, trying to uh, order back the tide. We try things that are not in the nature of things and we're inevitably disappointed. Um, King Canute was actually showing his advisors who told him he could order back the tide, just how, how crazy their suggestion was. Um, but all too, other, all too often, uh, people who do make decisions um, make it based on uh, a conviction that, you know, uh, they don't, um, that they can make a reasonable choice without really understanding what's driving the system that they're dealing with. And just as if you don't understand what drives the tides, there are inherent regularities, you're bound to be to get in trouble, so it is with complex systems. If we don't understand how they work, the, 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 the ways in which they're connected, their structure, we're bound to end up in a bad way. Even if we're properly resourced, we may go around in circles because the resources are not properly divided, such as between community care here on the right and acute care hospitals um, here on the left. We're out of balance and we find ourselves going around in circles. Fortunately, um, to address these challenges, um, we have a set of tools that you'll be learning about in this class. Um, the tools of, of system science, the science as a whole, and a key component of these tools. Professor Osgood. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I can't see, maybe, uh, I can't oh, see no, the I don't have slideshow. Oh, I'm sorry. Man. Okay, there we go. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Um, Yes, uh, okay, well, you'll have the slides posted. Thank you, Larissa. The systems problem, the imbalance, King Canute, there he is. And um, 
the consequences of the challenges and the so on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I need more Larissa's. Uh, so does the world, I think. But um, uh, moving on, um, thank you for alerting me. So models um, serve as these um, ways that we can help uh, address these challenges. They serve as ways of describing the structure of systems in the world, characterizing, um, as it were, the nature of things in the world. They're not necessarily correct, but they help us more quickly identify when our thinking is off base to move us more quickly towards thinking that's, um, that's more grounded, that's more uh, accurate, that avoids certain blind spots and that um, uh, supports uh, reasoning with added rigor. Um, so they're a tool for learning. Um, we, we capture in our models kind of a theory of the world, a theory of what's going on out there. Um, in terms of how one thing influences another. At a technical sense, we try to capture the causal structure of the system out there. And we do that in order to reason about counterfactuals, these situations we've never observed, but which could come about because of our actions or other factors. This is a bit different from data science. Data science tends traditionally to be backwards looking. We've got a bunch of data about the system and we try to learn from it. A lot of simulation modeling is about looking forward. It's not looking about looking at our rear view mirror. It's about going off road, going forward. And that's saying, what can we do differently that would get us to a better place? That's a difference from traditional system science. Turns out they can be used together hand and glove, but that's in that other class. S simulation models are representations of mathematical processes and, and we're characterizing processes out in the world. So um, this is a COVID-19 modeling. We have um, susceptibles, people who are exposed to infection but are not yet infectious. People who are pre-symptomatic, they they're infected, they're not yet having symptoms. And they either go on via what's called an oligo or pochi symptomatic pathway where they have minimal symptoms or they develop overt symptoms. Um, uh, and some of those may drive them to the hospital. This is an example of a, of a complex systems model. And behind it are a set of differential equations. Um, differential equations reflecting infection, or reflecting what we call the natural history of infection. It's progression over time. Um, people can get diagnosed here. And this exact model has been used to advise all the provinces in Canada uh, on, a, on a basis multiple times a week and our uh, provincial healthcare system on a daily basis. That's one type of model. Another type of model is uh, in the form of what we call agent-based modeling. Here we depict one or more populations at an individual level. We have individuals distinguished by their characteristics, perhaps uh, ethnicity and sex or gender, perhaps two separate things for each and, and income, um, uh, characteristics of those people. Um, and we characterize their evolution over time using different mechanisms. Here we have what are called stocks and flows. Here in agent-based models, we have what are called state charts very commonly, um, which some of you may recognize from UML, Unified Modeling Language, which, to which some of you may have, been explore, may have been exposed in 270 or 370. And so we characterize the evolution of a person infected by COVID-19. This model is used day in, day out to advise SHA. When the ministry screws up and doesn't take action, SHA is still using this model to shield themselves from the worst consequences of it, to keep the hospitals going. All through the summer, when the ministry turned a blind ear, turned a blind ear, turned a, a deaf ear to our, um, to our entreaties um, on the coming Delta wave, which was predicted with um, you know, extraordinary prescience, the SHA was training, training teams in ICU care, training teams to be available on the front lines uh, for the surge that was inevitably coming with each successive week of inaction by the ministry. When the rush came, it was by dint of that extra training in many ways that we survived utter disaster. And where did that training come from? By what was it motivated by this very model? that sits in front of you. Actually, it was a slightly evolved version of this, but never mind. Um, so uh, 
this model depicts the infection of individuals in the population. They're progressive among symptomatic and asymptomatic states. Um, their hospital needs here, their vaccination needs um, with respect to four different, three or four different vaccine types, et cetera. Um, a more refined version, their attitude, uh, where they are in terms of isolation um, in the community or in their home. And we can place uh, people in these models in geographies, um, um, look at specific distributions within cities and look at city specific quarantine measures or, or measures for mask use. And that's exactly what we do day in day out for, them, for the SHA and the ministry. We can put people in networks, one or more networks, family networks, collegial networks, networks of needle sharing for people who use drugs or, or, or for um, social, uh, social networks online for exposure to, to uh, troubling messages that might lead to risk of suicidal ideation, et cetera. Um, we can see spatial emergence. This is from chronic wasting disease with partners over in, in vet college looking at the spread of prions in Saskatchewan from infected deer, deer infected with the uh, terrible and fatal uh, affliction known as chronic wasting disease, uh, which risks potential human um, spillover. And we can place people in facilities. Um, here in Saskatchewan, our, our COVID-19 models has six different facilities depicted in a method known as discrete event simulation, where people flow through hospitals um, uh, to secure different levels of care from ICU, et cetera. And we can reason about uh, resource constrained processes within the context of these facilities. All of these are examples of models of complex systems. All of them are simulation models that seek to model an underlying process so we could undertake better learning, so we could ask what if questions, we can better communicate about it. We can better identify key uncertainties um, where a bit more evidence would play a huge, uh, have offered huge benefit for decision making. And generally, so that we can learn more quickly and more deeply and more reliably from evidence. Um, so, models allow us to use data um, for higher level insight um, and to inform decisions and to learn more quickly from this data. Um, and to, to leverage traditional tools. Models like this, you could think of them as maps, just like a map is by definition incomplete. Um, uh, the models are incomplete. They leave out things. A map of the city on your iPhone is gonna leave out where the blades of grass are, where it's a double stoplight, where there's a, you know, a, a protected turn on, on turn to the left or whether it's, it's unprotected. Um, but they're useful because they are abstractions that allows them to fit into your cell phone. Um, and it's the ability to omit these details that make, makes maps and simulations useful. And like maps, models are specific to purpose. If you needed a map that would help you figure out how to bike across the city, how to walk across the city, drive across the city, take transit across the city, or figure out why flooding occurs across the city, you'd use different maps. All maps like all models are in some sense wrong, but some are useful for particular purposes. Um, okay, I think I will stop there for today. Um, uh, next time, Thursday, uh, we will talk about why model um, from, from several perspectives. And we will then be going in to take a quick look at the three defining modeling traditions we'll be exploring in the class. To wit, agent-based modeling, system dynamics modeling, and discrete event simulation. We'll be recognizing their differences, but also some of their commonalities. Um, we using them as different lenses to understand different spheres of, un, of, of challenges within the world. And what we'll see in the later parts of the class is that these three types, which are oft taught to different classes of students who only get to learn about one type in a fragmented way, we'll be seeing how they can be combined into the most potent of hybrid types of models, 
which combine different areas of the model that are depicted with different modeling types and which can evolve nimbly in response to modeling challenges in learning. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, you have some sense of what's coming up in this class. Um, perhaps some of you will decide that other classes 